Welcome to this celebratory edition of the Old Fashioned Masonic Podcast. Today, we're excited to celebrate the most fierce fighting force in the world, the ones that don't eat those delicious crayons. Relax, Marines, we'll talk about you more in November. That's right, folks, we are talking about the United States Army. Hurrah! The United States Army is the land service branch of the United States Armed Forces. It is one of the eight U.S. uniformed services and is designated as the Army of the United States in the U.S. Constitution. That's right, men, the Constitution put this branch in service. The Army is the oldest branch of the U.S. military and the most senior in order of precedence. It has its roots in the Continental Army, which was formed on June 14, 1775, to fight against the British for independence during the American Revolutionary War. The U.S. Army is a uniformed service of the United States and is part of the Department of the Army, which is one of the three military departments of the Department of Defense. Did you know the U.S. Army is headed by a civilian senior appointed civil servant, the Secretary of the Army, and by a chief military officer, the Chief of Staff of the Army who is also a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff? It is the largest military branch, and in the fiscal year 2022, the projected end strength for the regular army was 480,000 soldiers. The Army National Guard had 336,000 soldiers and the U.S. Army Reserve had 188,000 soldiers. The combined component strength of the U.S. Army was just over 1 million soldiers. As a branch of the armed forces, the mission of the U.S. Army is to fight and win our nation's wars by providing prompt, sustained land dominance across the full range of military operations and the spectrum of conflict in support of combatant commanders. Now to some cool stuff. The Army's five core competencies are prompt and sustained land combat, combined arms operations, to include combined arms maneuver and wide area security, armored and mechanized operations and airborne and air assault operations, special operations forces to set and sustain the theater for the joint force, and to integrate national, multinational, and joint power on land. Let's talk about some badasses now. The United States Army Special Operations Command is the command charged with overseeing the various special operations forces of the United States Army. Headquartered at Fort Liberty, North Carolina, formerly Fort Bragg before we all got woke, it is the largest component of the United States Special Operations Command. At Fort Bragg, yeah, I said it again, the 82nd Airborne, the 3rd Special Forces Group, and the Secretive Delta Force is all based here. For those that don't know, the final test before joining the Special Forces is to complete Robin Sage. No, that is not an exotic spice for your meatloaf. This unique test for the candidates crosses dozens of counties in North Carolina. The test, called Robin Sage, is an unconventional warfare exercise that pits the Fort Bragg candidates for special forces against opposing forces in a fictional country called Pineland. Throughout the exercise, military and civilian personnel, as well as community volunteers who serve as auxiliary actors will participate in and provide support as role-playing elements. Robin Sage lasts for two weeks and is the final test for students who seek to graduate from the Special Forces Qualification Course. Now let's talk about some door kickers, the Rangers. The Army Rangers have a rich history beginning before the Revolutionary War, with units formed by Captain Benjamin Church and Major Robert Rogers. Rogers' 19 standing orders are still used today. During the Revolutionary War, the Continental Congress formed eight companies of expert riflemen known as the Corps of Rangers, commanded by Dan Morgan and including Francis Marion's partisans. In the War of 1812, Ranger companies patrolled from Ohio to Illinois. During the Civil War, John Singleton Mosby became a famous Confederate Ranger. After a hiatus, Rangers re-emerged in World War II, with six battalions trained using British commando standards and were led by Colonel William Darby. These battalions fought in North Africa, Normandy, and the Philippines, with notable actions at Point de Hoc and the rescue at Cabana Tuan. For those that know, Darby phase is quite a challenge. Sorry I digressed. The 75th Infantry Regiment, known as Merrill's Marauders, served in the China-Burma-India Theater. Post-World War II, Rangers were active in Korea, forming 15 companies and engaging in scouting and raids. In Vietnam, 15 separate Ranger companies were formed, serving until 1972. In 1974, the modern 75th Ranger Regiment was established, with battalions participating in significant operations like the Iranian Hostage Rescue, Grenada, Panama, and the Gulf War. In 1993, they fought in Somalia, exemplified by the Battle of Mogadishu. After September 11th, Rangers led the global war on terrorism, conducting missions in Afghanistan and Iraq. 
In 2006, the Regimental Special Troops Battalion was activated to support sustained operations. Today, the 75th Ranger Regiment continues to lead global combat operations and trains the next generation of Rangers. Now to some famous Army Freemasons. George Washington, first President of the United States and Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army during the American Revolutionary War. Andrew Jackson, 7th President of the United States and a Major General in the U.S. Army. Douglas MacArthur, 5-star General and Chief of Staff of the United States Army during the 1930s, played a prominent role in the Pacific Theater during World War II. Albert Pike, Brigadier General in the Confederate Army during the American Civil War, also known for his significant role in Freemasonry. We do admit he was a little bit of a wackadoodle. Benedict Arnold, initially a general in the Continental Army during the American Revolutionary War, before defecting to the British Army. Yes, we had some turds back in the day too. Thomas Jonathan Stonewall Jackson, Confederate general during the American Civil War, renowned for his tactical acumen. Omar Bradley, a senior U.S. Army field commander in North Africa and Europe during World War II, and a general of the Army. Creighton Abrams, commander of military operations in the Vietnam War from 1968-72, chief of staff of the United States Army. This dude has a tank named after him, Frederick E. Davison, the first African-American major general in the Army. Let's talk about a really decorated Freemason. That is none other than Audie Murphy. Audie Murphy was one of the most decorated American combat soldiers of World War II. Born on June 20, 1925 in Kingston, Texas, he became a symbol of American heroism and bravery. Here are some key highlights of his life and military career. Audie Murphy enlisted in the U.S. Army in June 1942 at the age of 17, after being rejected by the Navy and Marine Corps for being underage and underweight. He served in the European Theater of Operations, fighting in campaigns in Italy, France, and Germany. Audie Murphy received 33 awards and medals, including every major U.S. combat award for valor available at the time. These include the Medal of Honor, Distinguished Service Cross, Silver Star, with Oak Leaf Cluster, indicating a second award, Legion of Merit, Bronze Star with V Device for Valor, and the Purple Heart, three times. Murphy received the Medal of Honor for his actions on January 26, 1945, near Holzwehr, France. Despite being wounded, he single-handedly held off an entire company of German soldiers for an hour, then led a successful counterattack. After the war, Murphy became an actor, starring in more than 40 films. One of his most notable roles was playing himself in the autobiographical film To Hell and Back, 1955, based on his memoir of the same name. He also became a spokesperson for the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, then referred to as battle fatigue or shell shock. Audie Murphy died in a plane crash on May 28, 1971, near Catawba, Virginia. He was buried with full military honors at Arlington National Cemetery, where his grave remains one of the most visited. Audie Murphy's legacy as a war hero and his post-war contributions to film and veterans' advocacy continue to be remembered and honored. We're sure we missed some, but we've only got so long to keep your attention. Let us know who we missed in the comments. Thanks for watching the Old Fashioned Masonic Podcast. Disclaimer. The views expressed in this video do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the Old Fashioned Masonic Podcast, any Grand Lodge or Shrine Center, and we encourage viewers to conduct their research and form their conclusions based on reliable sources and personal beliefs. So all of the Karens and Kevins with complaints buzz off.